So I want to thank you for coming up. I, I realize it's uh, tricky to get the elevator and uh, get all the way up here to the 23rd floor, but uh, I do appreciate the fact that you spent the time and effort to try and get here. Uh, my name is Mike Anderson. I'm chief scientist for the PTR group, and we are a company that has been in the, of course, we've been using Linux now for quite some time. Actually, just after we were founded, we started using Linux. And uh, we had traditionally been a VxWorks real-time operating system kind of shop. So when uh, the embedded, when they first mentioned the concept of embedded Linux, we all laughed. It's like, ah, there's no way. You'll never be able to get it to fit. Because we were used to using boards that had 128K bytes worth of RAM. I mean, so when you're trying to deal with boards with very small memory footprints like that, Linux just wasn't even in the cards at that point. Fortunately, a lot of that has changed over the years, and of course, with the introduction of the real-time patch, that's changed quite a bit as well. But um, in our particular case, uh, we've been working a lot, a lot of the business that we do is with NASA. Uh, we have several projects right now that are all space-based robots. Um, many cases, we're actually using LIDARs for doing ranging on the robots. Uh, there are some nasty little treaties about uh, causing space debris. So the fact that we're coming up underneath a low Earth orbit satellite and grappling it to try and refuel it on orbit. Uh, if you make a mistake at those kinds of speeds, I mean, orbital velocity is what, six kilometers a second or something like that? So if you make a mistake at those kinds of speeds, it just creates this huge debris cloud and it becomes that movie gravity that everybody saw, right? We know, we know what happens with that. Uh, so we absolutely want to uh, worry about things like that. And uh, we've done a lot of uh, embedded ports to uh, both RTOS, Linux, and bare metal pieces. Uh, of course, tomorrow I have a presentation on IoT messaging, uh, where we'll get into some of the messaging techniques that are used in the IoT and how that's uh, applied. So lots of things that we're involved in. Uh, we've got a little over 35 satellites on orbit right now that we're maintaining. Some of them actually date all the way back to the 68302. So that chip hasn't even been in production for the past 20 years. So, uh, and they're still flying. So remarkably enough, things can still last. Yeah. Yes, uh, they've already been uploaded. So you can download them off of the, uh, the site. Uh, myself, uh, I've been in the industry now about 40 years. And uh, I got my first job as a programmer on an Altair 8800. Uh, so with, with floppy disks, and it had front panel switches, and we used to load a program in the front panel switches in order to get it to read the floppy disk. So it was basically a jump instruction that would jump off to the ROM. And uh, of course, in, in those days, uh, we used to use a radio, an AM radio. We would set it on top of the CPU because it would make noises as the CPU would do things. The CPU was so slow, it was a two megahertz processor. It was so slow that if you didn't have a radio to tell you that it was still working, you would think it had died. Uh, fortunately, with the front panel switch models, you could actually watch the blinky lights. But uh, then when they got a turnkey model, there were no blinky lights. So it's like, how can you tell if it works? We had a floppy disk. That was infinite storage, because you could always pull a floppy disk out and stick another one in. Infinite storage, 253K bytes at a time. All right, enough, enough down uh, history there. Um, so what we're here to talk about, we're here to talk about LIDARs and their use in navigation, uh, in particular for robots uh, that will be inside the house, although uh, not necessarily limited to just that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the drone-mounted LIDARs and things of that sort as well. So we'll talk about LIDARs, we'll talk about what options exist for LIDARs, and then we'll get into why would we put this thing on a robot? Why would we go to the trouble of doing this? And uh, we'll talk about how successful it was or not, as the case may be. And uh, we'll get into a summary. So let's talk a little bit about LIDARs. What exactly is a LIDAR? Well, it is uh, kind of a, a, a munging of what we used to call a radar, of course, radio detecting, uh, detection and ranging. LIDAR is light detection and ranging. So uh, unfortunately, there are lots of different ways that this is uh, put out there. It's either LIDAR, uh, lowercase i LIDAR, uh, all uppercase, sometimes they call them LADARs. Uh, it just depends on who happens to be selling it as to exactly what it is they call it. 
Uh, for purposes of this presentation, we'll just call it LIDAR with a all lowercase. Uh, it's effectively nothing more than a light ranging mechanism of some sort. Now, LIDARs themselves will use time of flight measurement. We'll see exactly what that looks like here in a moment. We've got a picture of that coming up. And we're trying to determine, okay, I send the, la the laser pulse out. How long does it take to reflect back? Simple concept, really nothing more than that. But the fact that you can do that at extremely high frequencies, that is very high data rates, means that you can get very fine granularity on the kinds of distance measurements that you're pulling back. The big problem is that when we deal with LIDARs, uh, in general, if we're dealing with a commercial LIDAR that is for the not, for the, not for the scientific market, let's put it that way, um, they're usually in the 600 to 1,000 nanometer range in terms of their light frequency. Unfortunately, this puts it right in the eye absorption range. So never look into a LIDAR with your good eye. Uh, now, ac actually, uh, in order for us to really be successful with LIDARs, uh, if they're going to be in this general range between 600 nanometer and 1,000 nanometer, uh, we need to use class one lasers. And class one lasers are eye safe. You can look into them, no problem with that. So um, they, uh, you, you do end up having to go with class one lasers, which unfortunately limits the power. Uh, it also limits the distance that you can get out of them. So they do have some limitations associated with that. Uh, when we start looking at some of the commercial LIDAR units, the commercial LIDAR units typically run in the 1550 nanometer range. And that is outside of the eye absorption range, which means they can run much higher power, which means they get greater distance. And that's one of the advantages, but the problem is as soon as you pop up to the 1550 nanometer range, you now, the cost kind of goes exponential on you. And we'll see some examples of those costs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll, I'll show you some pictures of that here in a moment. So because the LIDAR is basically a time of flight calculation between when the laser pulse goes out and when it gets detected, uh, we're basically able to then measure time because we know the speed of light and all that sort of good stuff, so we can actually determine how far away an object is. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about the way LIDARs typically work is there's almost always two eyes on the LIDAR. You have an emitter and you have a detector, and they're offset slightly. And the reason they're offset slightly is for triangulation purposes. So we know the distance, we know the angle between the two eyes, and therefore we can calculate using trigonometric functions exactly how far away the object is. So that's the basic idea behind how a LIDAR works. So it's not really all that complicated, and it's uh, very similar to some of the other modalities that we see, for instance, ultrasonic, uh, infrared, all basically work in the same principle. So where do you actually find LIDARs being used commercially? Well, the first picture that you see there is uh, what's called a flash LIDAR. And flash LIDARs are basically cameras. And what they do is they take a picture and each pixel is actually either 24 or 44 different laser pulses that then create the pixel. And what they'll do is they'll use false col coloring on there on the measurement for the actual distance to get the colors out there. Um, that is, uh, basically that's kind of the, the staple for the use of LIDARs. Uh, 3D maps from airborne platforms. There are, of course, orbital satellites that use LIDARs for doing mapping purposes. Uh, there are also, of course, now both aircraft and drones. Drones are becoming a big market now for the LIDAR space. But the other place that we see LIDARs used quite a bit nowadays is in self-driving cars. And uh, if you've ever seen, uh, for instance, uh, my daughter goes to Carnegie Mellon and uh, Uber has self-driving cars in Carnegie Mellon in the Pittsburgh area right now. So you see them go by a lot and they have this little spinning dome thing that sits on top of them. And that's the LIDAR that's trying to figure out exactly where the vehicle is in relationship to everything else. So uh, the LIDARs are actually becoming more and more popular, certainly coming into much greater use, especially when we start dealing with actual distance and trying to figure out where we are in 3D space. So there are some single point LIDARs that are out there. Of course, if you've ever had one of these fat maxes or one of the other measuring tapes that are out there, they have laser-based measuring tapes. 
uh, that basically do the exact same thing. And again, you'll notice in this picture, there are two eyes. There's an emitter on one side and a detector on the other. Uh, and of course, it doesn't project the marked laser beam out there into space. That's uh, thanks to uh, Walmart. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they decided they were going to put that measured laser beam out there because people think that, yeah, it's going to show them exactly how far away it is. Uh, whatever. Uh, and those types of single point LIDARs, unfortunately, they're not really made to be interfaced to. They're made as a sealed unit. So you can buy them. They, they sell for less than $100. You can buy them and tear them apart. And if you're good enough with your reverse engineering skills, you can actually figure out a way of being able to hack into it and use it as a, as a laser source. Um, unfortunately, that is way too much trouble uh, for what it's worth. So uh, fortunately, there are other alternatives that are available to us now. Um, you see the, uh, the one that is uh, this guy right here. Uh, this is from Garmin. Uh, there is actually a company called uh, Pulse Light that had sold that particular type of LiDAR. And they were selling it for an incredibly low price of only $150 a pop. Uh, and it was so popular that Garmin decided they were going to buy it. They bought the company, which unfortunately put them out of business for several months while they went to a new production facility. Uh, and unfortunately, that was right in the middle of the, of the robot season. So we couldn't buy the units. Really frustrating. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, this uh, unit can use either I squared C, it can use uh, PWM is the other option that it has available for it. Uh, but it runs off of five volt, and so it's fairly easy to wire it up to an Arduino or something similar like that and start using it to do measurements. Uh, it's reasonably accurate. It has a range of about 30 meters. So for small areas, rooms and things of that sort, it's not so bad. Uh, and at $150, it's fairly cheap, all things considered. Now. When we want to go beyond that, if we really want to start getting into uh, all sorts of interesting applications, we start getting into scanning LIDARs. Now, uh, the one that we had uh, back up here, this one, uh, you can actually mount that on a spinning turntable. I actually tried that, and of course, wire management is an issue because now you've got a wire that is now spinning at some rate. And uh, balance is another issue because it was never made to be do, ne never made to be spun like that. And so, uh, after trying three or four different attempts and uh, using servos and uh, stepper motors and a few other things, it's like, uh, no, nah, this is too much trouble. <laughs> okay, that's an interesting concept, but let's move on. So, uh, scanning lidars these typically move in a 360 degree range. Um, they will also, like you see here, they have their two eyes, their emitter and their detector. And these particular LIDARs can be very expensive, unfortunately. Um, this one actually uh, here, this one is not available yet. It's a model that will become available sometime, they say, in uh, late March, early April time frame. Uh, it was actually a Kickstarter campaign. And if you take it apart, it actually has one of the Garmin units inside of it. <laughs> Uh, interestingly enough. Now, this one is cheap for LIDARs. It's $350 um, if you can actually get it. So I'm waiting on mine to come from SparkFun. We'll see how that works out. Uh, this one up here, uh, this one is $1,300 for that LIDAR. And so LIDARs get very, very expensive very quickly, especially, as I said, if you're in the 1550 nanometer range. Uh, but all of these are in the smack in the middle of the infrared laser range. So they're, uh, unfortunately, don't look into it. Um, it would be a bad thing. The, uh, most of these are controlled either through I squared C, PWM, SPY, or in many cases, serial. So if you, uh, oftentimes when we're trying to actually spin the data, you know, spin the LIDAR, get the data off of it, uh, it requires quite a bit of transfer. Uh, so it puts a fairly significant load on whatever thing you happen to have attached to the LIDAR in terms of being able just to absorb all the data that it produces. So uh, there are a couple of other things that we see. Of course, commercial drone LIDARs. Uh, there are a number of manufacturers of these that are out there these days. Um, it's uh, the, the way the LIDAR is put together. These are, of course, the 1550 nanometer LIDARs typically. And uh, they're uh, relatively heavy and relatively power hungry. 
So time aloft with these types of drones is very short, uh, usually on the order of an hour or so uh, before it runs out. And that is if you can afford the $120,000 price tag for that little drone. Um, it's not a big drone. This is a little drone, $120,000. So uh, actually it's in euros. It's a uh, hundred and... 18,000 something or rather euros. So, uh, oh, but there's 10,000 euros in tax. So it's not quite that expensive. All right, uh, so that's kind of a cool object, but uh, again, kind of out of the reach of the typical hobbyist. Um, there, are, uh, there is one source for a cheap scanning LIDAR, and it is the Neato robot, uh, cleaning robot. So it's like the Roomba, except in this case, it happens to have a LIDAR mounted inside of it. And uh, if you take the, the robot apart, then you'll find the LiDAR sitting right in here. And that's what it looks like when it's extracted. You can actually get just the LiDAR unit, refurbished LiDAR units off of eBay for about $120. So, and then of course you have to figure out how to interface to the motor and how to interface to the LiDAR and how to get the data off of it. Fortunately, there are some teardowns that are available on the internet. Of course, SparkFun has one that goes into the details of it. Uh, there are a couple of other sources out there that if you really wanted to try to uh, scavenge uh, one of these Neato uh, LiDARs. The downside of that particular LiDAR is that it has a range of only five meters. So it's not very far. It doesn't have much in the way of distance. It's fine for a, a, a cleaning, for a vacuum. It's fine for a vacuum. Um, but for some of the applications that I had for it, not quite so good. So, uh, and I, again, I, I just kind of looked at it and go, oh, I'm going to have to figure out how, the, how to get into those JST connectors and all the rest of the stuff that goes along with it. Yeah, let's see if we can move on and get something else. So why are we really interested in a LiDAR? Well, we want to be able to do very fine ranging inside of a home, for instance, or inside of a building. And in order for us to be able to do that ranging, we actually need to combine it with another piece of information. And that is we will combine it with an inertial measurement unit, an IMU, and the IMU has got like three degrees of freedom for the gyro, the compass, and you know, for a magnetometer and for an accelerometer. So using those nine degrees of freedom, nine off board, we can then combine that information using sensor fusion with the actual distances that are being measured by the LIDAR and construct a map of what the room looks like. So that's basically what the Neato robot does. It runs around and uses the LIDAR to figure out what the room looks like, and then it figures out how to sweep the room. Uh, if you happen to have a Roomba, especially one of the earlier Roombas, you notice that it just moves at random. And it gets, it basically it moves in such a way that it hopes that eventually, if it, runs, if it doesn't run out of battery, it will have swept the entire floor. Uh, there's no particular rhyme nor reason for the way that it actually operates, which is in, infuriating, but it's interesting to watch the cats chase it. So it, it does have some interesting advantages there. Um, the actual measurement and the implementation of what they call SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, um, you will then uh, describe it in this wonderful little short um, math function here. Um, but basically all it's doing is it's taking the summary of all these distances that it's measuring, and then it factors in the navigation from the inertial, management, uh, inertial measurement unit to figure out exactly what sorts of things it's encountered and eventually build a map of the facility that it happens to be located in. And that's one of the things that uh, where I was trying to get to for this particular application. Uh, for what it's worth, Google has just released the SLAM algorithms that they use in their self-driving cars. I've taken a look at it, and definitely it's not optimized for hobby-type lasers, of course. Uh, and uh, it's um, unfortunately uh, quite a bit uh, computationally expensive. Because, of course, they're trying to solve a slightly different problem, keep cars from running into each other. Uh, at very high speeds. So most of the robots that I work with don't move any more than about 35 mile an hour. And um, you know, as a consequence, uh, that's a little bit overkill for my particular application. But once we tie it in with an inertial a measurement system, an inertial measurement unit, then we can do the data fusion and be, uh, use that to create an internal map 
of everything. And because we have the inertial measurement unit, we know exactly where the robot is at any one point in time. The robot doesn't know where it is when it first starts. It just simply starts scanning. And then as it moves, we have the uh, accelerometers, we have the gyroscope, so we can then figure out where the robot is pointing at any one point in time, and then use that to help construct this map that we're trying to build. So eventually what happens if we happen to get enough laser points, we can do one of these things they call a, a cloud, a point cloud. And what point clouds allow us to do is to have a 3D representation of whatever it is that we've just scanned. Now, in order to do a point cloud, it really isn't that complicated uh, if you happen to have a pan-tilt mechanism, say with servos or with um, uh, stepper motors, then you put that uh, Garmin LiDAR on there and you just simply start scanning. And you go scan, step, scan, step, scan, step, can't scan, step. And then after about five minutes or so, you have enough data to then be able to draw one of these point clouds. And that's kind of cool. Um, unfortunately, you can't really do that in real time. Uh, so it is a bit of a nuisance from that perspective. But it is still kind of cool when you go to your, uh, your students and you go, okay, well, let's build this thing and uh, describe what it's supposed to look like. And then they graph it and they actually can see somebody's face in the point cloud, which is kind of definitely very cool. Um, these can typically, in this particular case, it was imported into Blender and they use Blender to actually do the graphing, but you can use processing, you can use Python, MATLAB, so many different solutions for this. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, yes, yep. So lots of different options that are available here. Now, that's kind of the background theory on LIDARs. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, what we do in order to create a robot to mount the LIDAR on. Now, creating a robot is not something that you'll just wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna build a robot today, unless you've done it a lot. And fortunately, over the last eight years, I've had a great opportunity of working with the first robotics competition, and uh, that in the first tech challenge, and so we've had a lot of opportunity to build robots. Now, most of the robots that I build are 120 pound, 35 mile an hour kind of robots, so they're much bigger than what I really wanted to build here. I wanted to build something that would be able to navigate around in a, you know, a home without uh, running into things and without crushing the cat uh, if they happen to get too close. So when we're creating a robot, we really have to understand several different aspects. First of all, why are you creating the robot? What, do you, what is it supposed to do? Um, you know, in my particular case, I have a very specific sort of mission for it. So I understood exactly what I wanted it to do. In some cases, you just build one because it's cool and it's fun to do. And it's very educational if you happen to have kids who are also willing to sit down with you and, and actually go through the process. But we need to worry about things like how you're gonna move it. What's its mobility? Is it wheels? Is it tracks? Is it a hovercraft? Is it a drone that flies? How do you move this thing? Uh, we need to understand the motor controllers. So if our motors are, let's say, uh, you know, five amp motors, then I have to have a motor controller that can handle that kind of sustained current. I need to worry about not only the power draw, is it a nine volt, a 20 volt, a 24 volt, whatever kind of motor it may be, but I also have to worry about the steady state current. If I'm running at full speed, what does it pull? But then I will also have cases where I'm going full speed forward and I suddenly want to go full speed backwards. So now the amount of current draw at that is extremely large. And so it's not at all uncommon in the case of the first robotics type of robots to see 80 amps being pulled off of the battery at any one point in time. So, and it's really interesting for students when you, re when you explain to them that that uh, car battery that you're using on the robot will light them up if they manage to get across both the power and the ground side of that battery at any one point in time. So uh, we have to think about what kind of motors we're gonna be using. Are they brushed DC motors? Those are the simplest motors, but they also don't have a lot of precision associated with them unless we're going to then put an encoder on them of some sort. Um, brushless motors are usually uh, three-phase motors. They're easier to control, but 
you then have to have an electronic speed control in order to manage them. So there's a completely different sort of electrical harness that you have to have for brushless motors. Uh, how are you going to power them? I mean, the battery chemistry becomes a factor. Uh, we can certainly use battery chemistries like nickel metal hydride. Uh, we can use lipos, uh, lifey batteries. Um, now, lipo batteries have a great characteristic. They're basically flat until you get to the end of life of the battery, and then the battery drops like a rock. Unfortunately, on big robots, if you pull too much current out of a lipo battery too fast, it catches fire. Uh, one of the reasons why the TSA is not terribly fond of LiPo batteries as they get transferred around um, because that uh, fire problem is kind of an issue, especially if you accidentally short the battery, which I have seen students do on occasion. They, uh, they, they didn't realize that the power and ground was actually connected to each other when they plugged the battery in, and it does a halt and catch fire. It's amazing. Um, the, uh, of course, which controller you're going to use. Now, when we're using these motor controllers, the motor controller has to be controlled by something. So what is the something we're going to use? Uh, it has to be very reliable in the sense that the duration of the pulse, most of these are going to use pulse width modulation, the duration of the pulse, we can't see much jitter out of it. If we do, we've got a problem. Now, uh, we'll see examples here. I've got a, an example of how Linux sees these things. Of course, we also have other issues associated with the connection. How are we going to control it? Are we going to use wireless, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee? Uh, how far does it have to go? Does it have to go through walls? Uh, all those sorts of things have to be taken into account. So as you're going through designing a robot, you have a lot of pre-work that you have to think through in order to be able to make sure that you're going to have all the answers when you get there. Now, Linux and motor controllers, uh, a lot of the inexpensive motor controllers are going to be using RC hobby servo type signals. These are typically 50 hertz uh, pulse width, I mean 50 hertz uh, refresh rates and pulse widths in the anywhere from 0.5 to 2.5 millisecond kind of pulses. And these pulse widths, uh, if you're dealing with just a standard hobby servo, you know, so a servo is typically only going to have 180 degrees worth of motion out of it. And servos are basically encoder-based motors that will be able to repeat their location. If I say go to 170 degrees, it'll always be able to go to 170 degrees, assuming that nothing is blocking it for some reason. Um, so the servos themselves are pretty tolerant of pulse width variations. So if you're using uh, Linux with the real-time patch, then you can probably use Linux with a real-time patch on a hobby servo, and it'll probably be okay. But as soon as you start getting to some of these bigger motors and bigger motor controllers, then any jitter in the motor controller, in the PWM signal that's going to the motor controller, I've actually seen motors destruct themselves because the jitter was so bad. Uh, so in that case, if you want to try and avoid getting yourself into any significant trouble, then you need to think about how am I going to generate a reliable pulse width modulated signal to keep this thing fed and keep the motor controller from wigging out and then causing the motor to blow up on you. So uh, this typically means we're going to either use something like the BeagleBone PRU or we're going to use an Arduino or some other microcontroller where we can dedicate the controller to the actual generation of the signal so that we don't lose <laughs> sync on the PWM. So now uh, with all of that, uh, what exactly did I want this thing to do? Well, in my particular case, there are so many new LiDAR models that are coming out. Uh, I wanted to have a test bed that we could then set there and plug it in and determine whether or not this particular LiDAR is going to be easy to work with, hard to work with. Uh, I needed to have something that my students, uh, my robotic students would understand, just be able to look at, not be intimidated by the robot, and uh, be able to then focus themselves on the actual LiDAR unit itself and not worry about how everything else somehow worked. I also wanted to start playing around with some SLAM approaches. So the SLAM models are really important as we start seeing, for instance, in the first robotics competition, uh, they keep introducing new obstacles on the field. Every year the game is different. So you'd like to be able to create a map of what the field was so that you could then find out where your robot was at any one point in time. Uh, in this particular year's game, we actually have several blind spots on the field 
because there's an airship in the middle of the field and we can't see past it. So having the robot being able to determine exactly where it is at any one point in time, either with the LIDAR and the, and the SLAM algorithms, um, you know, really helps the students to be able to drive. Also, um, with the, the amount of data that's coming off of these, we're also starting to see uh, kind of problems with the students being completely overwhelmed. There's too much data coming off the robot. And it's that classic problem of, I can't be the pilot and the weapons officer at the same time. I have to have somebody else that helps me just to keep track of all the stuff that's out there. We already have that in FIRST. We have driver one and driver two. Um, but in this particular case, uh, even with that, they're starting to get overwhelmed with the amount of data that's coming off the robots. So uh, one of the other things, uh, yesterday I had an opportunity to talk about uh, using Alexa and creating an Echo-based device that uh, would allow you to interact with it. And I have several friends of mine whose parents are getting into the geriatric time and they don't want to be moved into a home. They want to be able to continue to live in their own home. Uh, but if they are living alone, you need somebody to be able to say, hey, have you remembered to take your medicine today? Uh, oh, by the way, did you eat lunch yet? Uh, because unfortunately, as they start getting a little bit older in age, they start forgetting to do things like that, and then their health starts to deteriorate quite significantly. So I was thinking, all right, let's see if we can come up with a way of being able to navigate around through the house, and have something that somebody could talk to. And just having something that you talk to, even if it's not all that complicated, you know, like where, where is Uganda? You know, but have an answer. And uh, it turns out that people really feel good about that. Um, it makes them feel good that there's something there that's going to interact with them and do more than just simply bark at them or require to be taken out for a walk. Uh, so uh, it, it really was one of those things of, hey, this is a great opportunity to do a service bot that then also allows me to experiment with all these other SLAM algorithms and LIDARs and kind of bring it all together in one piece. So choosing the platform was an interesting problem. Uh, again, I remember I, uh, I, I'm typically used to dealing with big robots, 100 pound plus kind of robots powered with car batteries. Um, that's not going to work in my kitchen. So at least my wife won't let me use it in the kitchen. It does sort of fit, but uh, she does, gets a little upset about it. And so I uh, looked at it and I go, well, all right. And if I wanted to bring it to a conference, having a 120 pound robot and a sealed lead acid battery, trying to get that on the plane is a little tough. It doesn't fit in the overhead. TSA doesn't like it. Uh, and then when they x-ray your luggage, they end up tearing your luggage apart because they can't quite figure out what that thing is in the luggage. So I said, well, I wanted something small. And I wanted something different. I built a lot of wheeled-based robots. So I thought, yeah, let's do something that's track-based. That sounds fun. So uh, I found this particular uh, model here. Uh, this is from a company called K-O-O-K-Y-E, Kooky. Um, that should have set off an alarm bell in my head uh, when you buy a robot from a Kooky company. Uh, we'll find out later exactly how that worked out. But um, the thing is that these particular motors, and the, the motors are located back here, so that's the actual drive wheel, and all the rest of these are passive. And uh, the motor itself is a 9-volt motor, but it has a 4.5 amp stall current. And at 4.5 amp stall current, it means that you're, you've immediately ruled out the L298 H-bridge type motor controllers because those things, uh, I mean, they're great motor controllers. Six volt motors, yeah, you can do that typically. Two amp max draws. But in this particular case, these guys draw way too much current, and I was concerned that it would toast an H-bridge. Uh, so I said, well, all right, we got to do something else. Now, uh, the plans for the controls. Uh, I've used both Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone Black in the past. And uh, the last robot that I built was a six-wheel drive all-terrain robot. Uh, using, red, uh, using BeagleBone Black, and it was very successful, but it didn't have a scanning LiDAR on it, and it didn't have all these other sensors that I was going to have to put into it. So I was concerned, I just, I'm guessing, you know, here I'm in the design phase, 
I don't really know how much data is going to be produced by this LIDAR because I don't have it yet. And I, uh, had it, it was on order, but it hadn't arrived yet. And as a consequence, I'm like, ah, you know, a BeagleBone Black would be great, or a BeagleBone Black Wireless would be great because now I've got the Wi-Fi interface on it. Um, but I was like, ah, I really don't know how much horsepower this is going to take. So I happened to have some Raspberry Pi 3s sitting around the house, and I decided, well, okay, we'll build it on Raspberry Pi 3. Um, in order for me to avoid the PWM jitter issue, even though you can run the, the, um, the real-time patch on it, uh, I wanted to make sure that I didn't get into any problems with the motor controller, so I uh, decided that what we would do is we would use a high-power motor controller. Um, this one happens to be from SparkFun. It is built as an Arduino shield. Now, when you buy it, it's unsoldered. So some assembly required, and if you don't feel comfortable with through-hole soldering, this is probably not the solution for you. Um, but the advantage of this particular motor controller is that it's a dual channel motor controller, uh, max current 30 amps, sustained, six, uh, excuse me, sustained 14 amps, and it can have a max voltage of up to 16 volts. So the way brushed DC motors work, if I have something that can handle up to 16 volts, but I only put 9 volts through it or less, then everything's good. I don't have to worry about burning anything up. So... Uh, that particular motor controller, I think, was like $60, uh, which is relatively cheap for a motor controller in that general range. Uh, the Sabertooth motor controllers that can handle 80, um, 80 amps are like 125 a pop per channel. So uh, that's a little bit on the expensive side. First Robotics, of course, has some really cheap ones at $45 that'll handle up to 80 amps. But they're big, and I didn't want to have to figure out how I'm going to get that on that little bitty robot. Additionally, it turns out there is an Arduino uh, hat that's sold for this particular, um, for the Raspberry Pi, and it implements uh, an Arduino Leonardo. So it's a 32U4 Atmel part, and it has the Arduino pinouts. That's the thing that you see, the kind of the blue and red things. Those are Arduino pinouts. So if you put the Arduino connector on this motor controller, it should then just plug directly into the hat that then plugs into the Raspberry Pi. That seemed like a really reasonable solution uh, considering the amount of space that I had on the robot. And I said, well, okay, I don't want to have, have multiple boards sitting out there. The weird thing about this uh, hat, unfortunately, is that you would think that since it's plugged into the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi would be able to talk directly to the Arduino through the Raspberry Pi pens. But you would be wrong. Um, you have to run a USB cable from the Raspberry Pi <laughs> to the Arduino shield. And that's not intuitively obvious in any of the description that they have for the shield. Um, of course, it's coming out of, uh, I think it's uh, DF Robot out of China. And um, yeah, they, they didn't say that you had to hook up the uh, Leonardo via uh, USB interface. And you just think, of course, it's going to be able to talk directly to the UART coming off of the pens on the Raspberry Pi. But no, nope, it doesn't. Go figure. All right. So how am I going to power this thing? Uh, because I wanted to be able to transport it without running into any uh, problems with our good friends at the TSA, I said, well, you know, let's go with uh, nickel metal hydride. Uh, nickel metal hydride doesn't have, doesn't have any requirements for special charging circuits. Um, unfortunately, they tend to be relatively large, but uh, in this particular case, it's uh, about uh, three quarters of a stick of dynamite. Oh, no, you probably shouldn't say that with the TSI. Uh, but no, it's a, it's, it's a relatively large package, but it's a 5 amp battery. So it can definitely power the unit for quite some time. Now, also, I found this really nifty breakout at uh, SparkFun, which is a USB micro connector, and you just simply hook power and ground to it, and now you've got a connection that just plugs into anything that uses a USB micro, and now you can power it externally. But, of course, uh, the thing that you have to remember is that uh, Beagle Bones and Raspberry Pis and things of that sort require 5 volt. And my battery was a 9.6 volt battery. And you can't just simply plug 9.6 volts into a, uh, a development board like that. It'll toast it. So we had to go through a power transformer. Well, in my particular case, it turns out there's a really cheap way to do this. And it's called a universal battery eliminator circuit. And these things sell for about 10 bucks. 
And they're made for RC aircraft. They're made to actually power the receiver on RC aircraft. They're a buck transformer. And uh, the particular one that I'm using here can handle up to 10 amps. So it'll definitely handle whatever it is the Raspberry Pi drains, which is about two amps, and then plus the LiDAR, which is gonna pull quite a bit more power off of it as well. So uh, that was the basic model that we were using as far as the controls are concerned. Choosing the LiDAR, I have uh, four or five of the Garmin LiDAR units that I've used in, in past games and things of that sort. And they're great, but again, that whole, I wanted to have a scanning LiDAR. So just to make things more difficult for myself, I go, well, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna use that. I'm gonna use a scanning LiDAR of some sort. Uh, it turns out that uh, the cheapest scanning LiDAR that I could find was about $400. And that's this guy here, the RPI LiDAR A2 unit. Uh, this is from a company called Slamtech. Uh, it's 4,000 samples a second uh, at 10 hertz and then 600 RPM is how fast the little bulb spins around. Uh, it's also relatively low uh, profile. So it's only about, uh, say, two inches high. So it's not very high. That, of course, will come back to haunt me a little bit later when I start mounting everything. Uh, wiring up. Uh, it took about, uh, I guess, two days, two and a half days to wire it and to actually construct the robot was, building the robot took me a better part of a day. Actually, I used slave, I mean, uh, student labor uh, to build a robot. It's like, hey, would you like to build a robot? And they go, oh, we got nothing else to do right now because we're getting ready to put the robot in a bag. Uh, so, sure. So, um, I allowed the students to build the actual robot. Um, which was a mistake as it turned out, but uh, nonetheless, it was, uh, it was a good exercise for them, and then I only had to redo part of it. Um, I then, of course, uh, uh, can talk to the Arduino using RS-232. It turns out the RPI LiDAR also uses RS-232, so I just needed to make sure that I had enough high-speed serial ports, of which the Raspberry Pi has only one, uh, to be able to communicate with everything, so it was USB to serial port adapter time. Uh, and that seems to work okay. Uh, also, I used Anderson power poles, no relation, unfortunately. I really wish it was, I wouldn't be here, I'd be retired someplace. Uh, but Anderson power poles, these things are used in the ham radio community quite a bit. They're just a quick connect, disconnect kind of power. And so I could easily, uh, what I did was I cut the Tamiya connector off of the uh, battery and then put Anderson power poles on it. And then it just becomes a real quick connect, disconnect. So I don't have to worry about putting a switch in the circuit to shut the battery off. Then, uh, so this is the finished robot. Uh, I'm not sure if you can actually see all the, the elements inside of this, of course. We have the tracks. Uh, we have the Raspberry Pi here. We have the uh, shield mounted on top. There's the, uh, you see the blue and red uh, elements of the Arduino uh, shield, or the Arduino hat, and then the motor controller shield sits on top of that. Uh, it turns out that this whole scaffolding environment here did not exist. I had to fabricate that. Um, yeah, it was a nuisance, but uh, nonetheless, I needed to get the LiDAR up above everything so that I didn't have anything that was interfering with the scan. And uh, I also added one more thing to it. On the front here, I added a USB camera just so that I could see where the robot was in case I couldn't actually physically see it. I could at least see where the robot thinks it is. Um, and then uh, could take control of it. Uh, control, of course, all being done using uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, of course, uh, in this particular case, I mounted a tux on the top of it, but he spins too fast and gets out of balance, so I had to take it off. Too bad. Now, software. Uh, so it's taken me several days to build the robot, and in terms of actual invested money here, uh, we're talking about $600 or so, 700 actually, probably close to $700. And uh, I don't, it can't move yet. I gotta have some software on it. So uh, fortunately, SparkFun had an example for the Arduino uh, where uh, it would at least be able to control the motor, be able to turn the motor controllers on and off. Of course, it wasn't set up to be controlled with RS-232, so I had to modify it in order to be able to do that. Um, and it also turned out that for the LiDAR, SlamTech, the company that, sold the, that sells the LiDAR, actually has an SDK available for it that works for C and C++. And of course, if you want to use uh, Java, you can use JNI, or if you want to use Python, you can use the Python C call, so um, that all works there. 
But um, even though they have an SDK, it was going to require quite a bit of development time in order to be able to spin the LiDAR up and then start sampling it, figure out what the measurements were. Yes, there are some documents that describe all of this, but it's fairly complicated to interface to one of these things. So as I was looking around, I actually found uh, an existence of, the, uh, of some SLAM code uh, for a robot operating system, for ROS. And it turns out that the, uh, the SlamTech RPI LiDAR happens to have a package that works in ROS. So it's like, oh, cool. I'll use ROS as the way of being able to at least interface to the LiDAR and uh, handle it that way. Unfortunately, uh, ROS is a fairly complicated package. <laughs> so uh, ultimately, I want to use ROS for the entire robot, but to get started, I'm just going to use ROS to do the measurements on the LiDAR. Uh, ROS is available for Raspbian. It's also available for Ubuntu. So uh, they have pre-built packages for both of those versions of the operating system. Uh, that's a hell of a lot easier to work with that than it is to try and build ROS from source. Um, that I didn't want to start messing around with, uh, you know, cross-compiling and everything. So it was uh, just, the, again, the path of least resistance here. Um, now, there were some references to the RPI LiDAR, uh, an earlier version of it on hackaday.io, not hackaday.com. Um, unfortunately, it was for an older version of ROS that was not forward portable, uh, so I needed to go poke around a little bit further to try and find uh, a version that would install correctly and work with the LiDAR. Um, ROS does support a publish subscribe model. So if you're familiar with how publish subscribe models work, basically you have a data source, you publish the data, somebody else subscribes to it and they get the data on a refresh rate. Uh, fortunately, there's a wiki for the RPI LiDAR in ROS. So there were pieces, took a little bit of research in order to figure out where all the pieces were and then to try and put them all together into one place. Uh, so I used, it turned out that most of the documentation for using ROS uh, tends to be very Ubuntu-centric. So uh, the path of least resistance on the Raspberry Pi was to use Ubuntu Mate 1604. My preference would have been Raspbian, but uh, it was just like, okay, how am I going to get this thing working before the show? Because I wanted to bring it here. Um, ROS, of course, is, uh, again, only being used for the LiDAR at this point. But uh, once I finish with all of this, there will be a GitHub repository. And if you send me an email, I'll be happy to send you the link on it when everything's said and done uh, so that you can take a look at how it was put together. So I got it up and running. And I got ROS scanning. And I have a, it's a you can see it here. Uh, these are basically uh, desks and tables and things of that sort inside of the room. So every one of these red lines represents some obstacle that's in the field of view. Uh, it turns out that's a person, and that's a person too. And it's kind of cool as they walk through because there's this line of pixels that move through the screen as the thing updates. Uh, so it's kind of a cool solution, but of course this is just the first step. This is just the distance measurement part. This hasn't integrated it into the actual SLAM algorithm yet, and I don't have the IMU up and running for it yet, so I can't start doing mapping inside of the house uh, at this point. But again, a lot of the pieces are there. So current status, wireless communications works. Actually, I did this uh, a couple of years ago and had a robot here at uh, ELC that was uh, being driven with uh, Xbox controllers through Linux. So it was, uh, I basically was running the Raspberry, excuse me, the BeagleBone Black on the robot. It was the server. My uh, controller with the Xbox controller was the client. I would connect over using standard sockets and then I would start sending joystick commands across the link, and I could drive the robot around, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it means that I could then do some code reuse. Of course, that's always important, right? Um, and pull all of that information about uh, using the controls, getting the joystick working. I mean, these are all little things, but they're nagging things when you say, OK, well, how does, a, how does an Xbox controller work? You know, what events does it generate in Linux when you push the button or when you move the joystick? Because there's analog portions, there's digital portions. How does all that work? Um, so that is already out in my GitHub repository. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can go out there and check that. But right now, I don't have the IMU in integrated yet because I'm thinking that I'm going to convert this all over to ROS. 
I need to be able to get an IMU that ROS understands. I don't want to have to write a new set of drivers just to be able to use ROS. Uh, I, uh, as I had all this put together, I'm ready to start testing, and I find out that one of the motors is borked. Uh, dead locked up. It will not move. No matter how much force you put into it, it is dead in the water. Um, power doesn't do it. You know, you can't even turn it with a pair of pliers. I disassembled the gearbox and thought I had it all put back together again. And when I put it back together again, it wasn't any better. So I've contacted the kooky people and uh, the kooky people are now arguing with me about uh, this motor control, about the motor. And I go, dude, it didn't work. <laughs> I've only had it a week, it didn't work. Well, you know, people have problems with power. And it's like, okay, dude, I've been building robots for eight years. I understand which is the red and which is the black and where you put the positive and where you put the negative. Uh, okay, but th so that's the argument that I'm going through right now. Uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'm fed up enough with them that I've said, you know what, uh, okay, I'm gonna get a different robot. So that's a new one that's on order. Um, that one's, uh, I think, $130 or something like that. Uh, but that one has four sets of motors on it. So I'm going to have to use a different motor controller and do things a little bit differently on it. But nonetheless, um, I, I will hope that I'll be able to get a replacement motor from the kooky people. Um, but if not, then I'm going to have to punt that particular effort, take everything, transplant it over to the other robot, and try it again, which is not my desired situation, but that's the way it goes in the robot business. So our summary here, uh, the first attempt at using a LiDAR, uh, this has been a really interesting exercise. Uh, it required me to learn a lot about what LiDARs are and how they work and what they do. Um, it, uh, I found you know, a reasonably inexpensive one uh, at $400. Uh, that's definitely not something that uh, most people would think is inexpensive, but for LiDARs it is. Uh, it turns out that Linux can handle most of the services with no problem. Um, the only issue that we have with Linux and this type of robotic application is uh, the issue associated with the motor controllers themselves and making sure that we can guarantee that PWM signal coming into the motor controllers. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, uh, if I had had the BeagleBone Blue at the time, well, it still doesn't handle the power, so I would have to still do something else differently with that. With that. But um, that uh, definitely is, uh, kind of a work in progress and I hope to have everything operational again as soon as I can get a replacement motor uh, within the next couple of weeks or so. And then we'll transfer, translate it over to ROS. It turns out uh, Arduino, I mean the, the Linux drone project has a lot of cool stuff. ROS has a lot of cool stuff. So there are several different frameworks that you can use to actually control this. Um, the real driving factor for me in this case with ROS was the fact that the RPI LiDAR already had an interface, a package for ROS that I could then just instantiate and start pulling data off of it. So software development, probably at least another two, three weeks worth of software development and I should have it all working, at least mechanically if I can get the replacement motor out of them uh, or end up buying new motors. I don't know what I'm gonna have to do on that, but uh, you know, the whole interface to the tracks and everything is going to be totally screwed up if I have to get different motors. So I don't know. I'm going to have to machine something. I'm not looking forward to that. A 3D print. I could always 3D print it, I guess, right? Uh, so looking forward to getting the unit back online. And uh, it's been an interesting exercise, but I hope you got something out of this. Uh, we got just a couple minutes for questions, and then we have to move on. Anybody? You're all still asleep. I understand. Yes? Yes, I have. Uh, now, those are industrial LiDARs, and they're usually uh, you know, $100,000 for one of those things. Um, they are extremely good in terms of their resolution, but um, that the, the issue is um, because of the way the LiDAR is put together, uh, it's tough to get it into orbit because the boost, uh, you really have to do some significant packing and, and, and protection of the LiDAR unit itself. Measurement. Yeah, it was just for measurement. Yep. Yeah. What's the difference between LiDAR and a time of flight camera? Ah, uh, so time of flight cameras are typically focused on, <laughs> focus, right? Uh, they're, they're typically uh, built specifically for camera pictures for being able to do imaging. So that's very much like a flash LiDAR, also does the same general ideas. They're to produce an image of something. 
Um, time of flight is pretty much time of flight. So whether you're using you know, ultrasonic or infrared or light lasers, whatever it is, it's still the same basic concept. So it's just a question of how do you power it? Uh, is it eye safe? You know, what are the constraints that are associated with it? What's its range, its distance, and all that sort of stuff? Um, so there really isn't a whole lot of difference when you're, start, when you're talking about time of flight. Um, now, in terms of your particular implementation, I'd have to see which camera it was to be able to tell you if, how, what, what it was, how it was different, how it was similar. Yeah. Yep. Anything else? Your email address? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, let's see here. I think I have it here. Yep, there it is. There I am. So I appreciate your time. Hope you had something out of this. Thank you very much. Talk to you later. Thank you.